Greg Thompson Sports Show. You are joining us for this ninth episode of our new show's debut. And tonight, what everyone is talking about is the NBA playoffs. And it's it's an exciting time to be able to take a look at what's going on in, in basketball, what's going around. We've talked about March Madness. We've talked about all the different things with you know, the NFL coming into to where it is. We've talked about Major League Baseball opening day. And I know uh, I, I'm a big NBA fan. I know everyone doesn't love the NBA. But one thing that I think is uh, a really unifying point is the NBA playoffs. I think that, you know, sometimes maybe the season, just like I, I don't love baseball all the time because it's hard for me to get into a random game in August and things like that. But I love playoff baseball. And basketball, I do enjoy regular season basketball, uh, you know, uh, a ton. But playoff basketball is is fantastic because you have these elite athletes. I, I think the best athletes on the planet um, going all out every single possession the entire game. And, and it's just a really fantastic performance to watch. And that um, I do like college basketball, but it's noticeable when you watch a lot of NBA basketball and how creative those shot makers are how talented they are how hard it is to stop nba players from scoring even when you have really good defenders it really stands out to see that level of talent and um i love the the performance of the way that they they go about things so uh one of the things that we're going to take a look at here is each of the opening round playoff series. I've got two awesome guests coming out, uh, two sets of interviews coming up. We've got the voice of the, the Hawks, Steve Holman, which is a great connection from fantastic producer Lauren. And then we have two folks that you know, Pat Moran, who is our uh, resident Knicks fan and a fan uh, person that many of you around Bills Mafia know. And then Burn River Sports is coming back, uh, who is a huge Cavs uh, fan here in Cleveland. And we talk a little bit about each of the series and, and then specifically Cavs and Knicks, which I think is easily the, the best opening series in the playoffs. But we'll go through a little bit, and I'm going to let you know who I think is going to take down each series and give you what I think are going to be the winners. I want winners. So let's go through, you know, right now, while I'm talking, we have uh, the play-in games going on. Um, we've got, you know, a, a, a tough game between Chicago and Miami. And congratulations, the winner of that game gets to go play play Giannis Antetokounmpo and the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, it doesn't matter who wins that game tonight. Uh, that game's going to be, you know, probably uh, I'll call it a gentleman's sweep. Is it, you know, I think maybe they get one game and it's a five game series, but Milwaukee's going to walk away with that. It might simply be four straight and four zero and, and a clean sweep, but Milwaukee, there's no chance either of those teams have of hanging with Milwaukee in that series. The two seven series in the matchup uh, again, it's Boston Atlanta. Atlanta looks scrappy in that game, you know, in the, the initial game going against Miami. I, I, I really thought Miami was going to take it. But, you know, DeJounte Murray and, and Trey Young made some shots. I, again, I just don't see much of a chance. Uh, you know, most Vegas lines have Boston as like a minus thousand favorite. So, you know, they're talking 10 to 1 to, to be able to to have an upset there. And I just can't pick it. I don't think it's feasible. Um, I, I think it's going to be pretty chalk, both Milwaukee and Boston, probably in a route, probably again, maybe Atlanta steals one game, Trey Young gets crazy hot in one of them, maybe you get a five game series, but um, I think it's there and uh, fantastic producer Chris has a buck sweep there, I think that's probably right. Um, the next one is, I want to say it's interesting, the Sixers are the three seed against the Brooklyn Nets and, you know, Philadelphia has right now maybe the most dominant player in basketball in Joel Embiid. He's he's a monster to be able to stop. James Harden is amazing in the regular season. He's not always the most amazing in the playoffs. We'll see where that goes. I think Brooklyn is getting a lot of credit for how scrappy they've been, but 
I, I think they're also getting credit for a lot of those Kevin Durant wins ever since the trade. They're 13 and 17. So good on them for not completely going in the tank. I think after that trade, a lot of people thought they were going straight to the lottery and, and literally just going for a full on tank. So good for them hanging in there and playing almost 500 basketball. Uh, but there's still, you know, 13 to 17 is what it is. Uh, Mikhail Bridges looks like a, a real significant piece, but they're not that close. I think Philadelphia actually walks away with this one pretty cleanly. The 4-5 matchup, obviously you'll hear a little bit more of my thoughts in the discussion with Pat and Rich, but I think this is the most exciting and most fun matchup. There's one in the West that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, I, You know, I'm... I'm jaded. I, I'm a Cavs season ticket holder. Uh, obviously, I'm going to pick the Cavs here. Um, but I think it's it's crazy not to think that the Knicks don't have a chance. I, I think the Knicks are a really tough team. If Julius Randle was 100% healthy, maybe they'd have even a better shot. But I, you know, Jalen Brunson beat uh, a Cavs team or, you know, just a couple weeks ago by putting up 48 points. Isaac Okoro and Jared Allen didn't play at that game, so I think it's kind of tough to to take everything away from it. But um, I do think the Cavs can win this. I think it's going to go six or seven. I think it's going to be the most entertaining uh, series in the opening round. Switching to the West, um, I'll start with what I think is going to be the most exciting uh, series in the first round in the West. That's Sacramento Golden State. I'm so happy, happy for Sacramento Kings fans. You know, 18 years out of the playoffs, and they finally break that drought. As a Bills fan, obviously we know exactly what that's like to go that long without a, a playoff appearance. So it's awesome for them. Not only did they make it, but they're a three seed. Um, by far the best offense in the NBA, putting up a crazy amount of points every week. They don't really stop anyone from scoring. But unfortunately, their prize for earning the three seed and home court advantage is they get to play the defending champion Golden State Warriors uh, and, you know, one of the most veteran savvy and experienced teams. Um, you know, Vegas actually has Golden State as a pretty decent favorite. I think the Kings have a chance here. Um, so I am picking Sacramento in an upset, which is weird calling a 3-6, and I'm picking the three uh, team as the upset. Um, but I am picking the Kings in an upset there. And I think most advanced analytics show this is like a 50-50 series. Um, ESPN's uh, BPI indicator has it as a 50-50 series. But Vegas has the Warriors like minus 265. You're going to need like plus 200. You can win double your money. If you bet $100, you win 200 if Sacramento wins this series. I actually think it's a pretty savvy bet. Um, there. So I, I like that one a lot and, and we'll see where we're going. I think that, you know, I think it is 50, 50, there's a full chance the golden state wins, but the fact that you get double your money, if Sacramento wins, I think that's a good bet. Um, the four or five matchup there is also one that on paper looks really close. You have the LA Clippers against the Phoenix suns and you know, the Clippers, their roster looks amazing on paper and that, you know, when you have, you know, Paul George and Kawhi Leonard and, and the, the depth of talent that they have there, it should come together really well, but man, Phoenix is a wagon. I, I mean, they're eight. No, when Kevin Durant plays, it's only eight games. It's a small sample size, but Chris Paul, Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, and you're asking Deandre Ayton to be your eighth piece in there i i just i i'm have i'm hard pressed to pick anybody to beat phoenix all the way through i i think right now if, if you really push me i i think i'd pick phoenix to win it all um so we'll see where it goes you know i think it could be a really good matchup depending who comes out of the east but um i, I think phoenix is gonna be a really tough out for anybody um the top two ones are interesting i i think that we have a little something here. We'll have the play-in game later. Um, you know, I I don't think it's going to terribly matter which team, you know, faces you know faces them faces the Nuggets. Uh, I think that Oklahoma City is a really odd team. I think it's weird that they're you know out there playing. I think Minnesota, if everybody's playing right, and you get like a tough. Anthony Edwards uh, game. I think that they could be scrappy. I expect Minnesota to win that play-in game tonight and for them to be the team that plays Denver, but I don't think it's going to matter. 
I think Denver can run both of those teams out of the gym. Jokic and their offense is too much. I don't know if Denver is a legit one seed in traditional basketball power sense, and I don't know that they're the favorite in the West. I think that Phoenix rightfully is the betting favorite in the West, but they're going to, I think, pretty handily win that. Maybe Minnesota wins a game, but I think that's a five-game series. The interesting one is now what was a a train wreck early in the season when LeBron started to go out, it seemed like maybe they were even going to go in the tank. And now all of a sudden you have these trades, you bring in, you know, Malik Beasley, you have the, you know, emergence of Austin Reeves, you have Vanderbilt's performance and you have Anthony Davis healthy and playing well. And LeBron seeming to be LeBron right now going into what was at one point, like a title favorite Memphis who all of a sudden looks vulnerable, doesn't have Steven Adams. And now you're asking a front line of, you know, Jaron Jackson Jr. is great on help defense when he has Steven Adams there, but you're asking him to now have to go, you know, 35, 40 minutes with Anthony Davis, Jared Vanderbilt and LeBron James. And I just, I I don't know. I I don't know if they're going to have it. I don't know if they're going to be able to pull that off. And I I think the Lakers pull an upset here as well. So I I think that we're going to see a couple upsets uh, there. And I think that going to Joey Hansen, picking the Cavs to beat the Suns in the finals. um, I I don't think that's going to happen, but that sounds awesome. I would love for that to be the case. Um, I'm going to pick the Lakers to be able to upset Memphis. I think it's going to go seven. Um, but I think the the Lakers are going to upset uh, Memphis and be able to make it an interesting matchup where I, I think we might see Lakers Kings in the second round, which I think is a crazy thing to think of if you go back just two months ago. So um, again, just, you know, a, an exciting way to look at all the first round matchups here. Uh, if you're looking from a gambling standpoint, I actually think you can do a couple fun things where, you know, see a uh, series like, Phoenix and um, over the Clippers, the Sixers over the Nets, the uh, the Celtics over the Hawks, the Nuggets over either Minnesota or OKC, and Milwaukee over uh, either uh, team, Chicago or uh, Miami right now while we're recording. Uh, Chicago is up by three. It doesn't matter who wins that. You can throw those season, those series uh, wins in into a lot of, different uh, parlays and you can get yourself some really good odds where, you know, I get it that, you know, adding in a minus 1000, minus 800, minus 900 series. But when you add in multiple of them, it can give you better odds in some of those. And when you do it, yeah, you know, NBA series are set up that way for a reason. So if you want to juice the odds for a Lakers, if you want to juice the odds for a Cavs, if you want to juice the odds for a Kings, add in some of those other series and you can get yourself some better odds where you're really just betting on do the Cavs beat the Knicks, do the uh, Kings beat the Warriors, do you know do the Lakers upset the Grizzlies. That's really what you're betting on, but you're getting better odds in just that series by throwing in some of those favorites where it's very, very, very likely for them to hit. So uh, some of the things that Rich taught us and some of his uh, uh, Uncle Dickie's uh, you know, uh, average size parlays, that, that's a good a good way to approach it. So uh, without further ado, we are going to bring in our interview with the voice of the Hawks, Steve Holman, a really good conversation, excited to bring him aboard. And without further ado, we'll bring in Steve. And now joining us, the voice of the Atlanta Hawks, Steve Holman. Steve, how are we doing? Great, great, great. Great to be with you. Yeah, I appreciate you giving me just a little bit of your time here. I know it's been uh, kind of a fun, you know, run here for the Hawks, you know, uh, taking care of the Miami Heat. but. The reward for that is now facing uh, the Boston Celtics. How how are things uh, kind of going for the the fan base and the people around Atlanta? Well, I think you know people are excited that they made it through that uh, play in, and you know to play the number two seed, you have that's kind of the penalty of being in the play in. Uh, the seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, at least with the seven, eight, if you would lose that game, like Miami's got a chance now to uh, advance. Uh, you you get two cracks at it. If you're the nine ten though, you get one chance at it, yeah. and that's it. And uh, you know, uh, lo and behold, Toronto had a big lead in their game, and then ended up losing. So the Bulls now advance to take on Milwaukee. So uh, you know, if you make it into the into the play in, you're going to expect to either play the number one or number two seed. So that's the way it 
that's just the way the cookie crumbles. Yeah, it's and I think both play-in games were good examples because obviously I know uh, Dejounte Murray had shared the posting where I think seventeen experts all pick the Heat to, to the advance ESPN, and the whole ESPN crew. Yes, they. Uh... <laughs> Not and I know the same in yeah. in uh, in the Toronto uh, Chicago game. An awful lot of people were picking Toronto to see both uh, games go that way. I think it really kind of speaks to the purpose of that playing tournament is yeah. getting that group in there and whoever's hot at the right time gets to advance. Of course, the Raptors missing eighteen free throws didn't help them any Ooh. in that Ooh. game. <laughs> yeah, that that's a tough one. That's a tough one. It's it, it's interesting, and I think that seeing a team like Atlanta with the way that they've come together, bringing in a talent like Murray and kind of having to figure out a way, how do you fit that in with, you know, such a talent like Trey Young? I think, how have you seen that change with the early season part? And then how has, you know, adding Quinn in the coaching role, has he been able to instill his system or ideas or really been kind of just doing what he can in this last stretch? Yeah, well, Quinn Snyder has, has definitely put his stamp on things in the last 20 games when he took over. Uh, and you can see improvement in a lot of different areas. The the scoring has gone up. Uh, he's an analytics guy as far as the, you know, three-pointers are more important than two-pointers because if you do the math, you know, it comes out that way. Uh, so he's improved that. Uh, I think there's a couple of guys on the team that have really uh, benefited from Quinn being in, in, the, in the role that he is now, and uh, that would be Jalen Johnson, who was our uh, number one pick a couple of years ago out of Duke, and Oka, uh, and Yeka Okongwu, who was the number one mm -hmm. six pick, uh, the number six pick in the entire draft, uh, he's really uh, taken advantage of having Quinn here. But the defense is better. Uh, they were uh, much better against Miami uh, the other night, and I think Quinn really uh, put his stamp on that too because the Hawks went for offensive rebounds like crazy in that game. And they, uh, they out-rebounded uh, Miami by a lot, and they kind of out physical them, which is something the Hawks haven't really been known for all year is to be very physical. So they, they put that part of it in the game too. So uh, I think they've really made some great strides, and it's terrific that they were able to get Quinn Snyder in here for the final 20 games so he can evaluate everything, uh, you know, take a look at all of it and, uh, you know, go from there. Yeah, I think, you know, it it's interesting. We're kind of seeing the the center position come back into basketball. You went a while there where obviously the, the Warriors kind of made people think that not having a center wasn't a big deal. Now you see you this run of whether whatever you want to count Giannis as, but you know, a huge seven foot player and Embiid and, and Jokic and the MVP runs. I think a really underrated combo is what Atlanta can bring with both Capella and a Kongu and, and always having one of them available around the court um, and, and having that physical element come back into play. You know, when you have a team like Boston where so much of their talent is out on the wing, is that an area where maybe they can try to, you know, make this a little bit more interesting in matchup than people think? Well, I think, uh, I think that they have a size advantage. That's one of the, uh, the things that the Hawks have going. And Jalen Johnson has become a big part of the, the rotations now too, that he, he wasn't, before Quinn got here and you know he's a big six eight guy he can play defense he runs the floor he can actually handle the ball so I think he's going to be helpful because the Celtics like to put uh, Tatum and Brown in there together at the forward spot so they give up a little height uh, in that and uh and if Al Horford's playing too I mean he's he plays a lot of the in the quarters for three point shots and everything so if the Hawks can you know be physical up front with them and I think they're de the Hawks are very deep too so I know that uh, nobody's giving the Hawks a chance in the in the whole series, but you know that's why they play the games. And uh, nobody gave the Hawks a chance against uh, Miami either the other night. So I, I think that there are some wrinkles that Quinn has put in. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see. And you know he was not here for either of the two regular games that the uh, Celtics beat the Hawks in. The last game of the season was just a you know it was a scrimmage basically. Both sides. Uh, didn't play anybody. Uh, all five Hawks starters stayed home. Uh, uh, the Celtics did the same thing. So uh, it's going to be interesting. I mean, the, the Hawks do have the the advantage, I think, of having that play-in game earlier this week. The Celtics haven't uh, had their full squad play a regular game for a long time, so they could be a little rusty on uh, in the afternoon game coming up uh, tomorrow. So uh, we'll see. I mean, it's like I say, that's why they play the games. I think Trey has stepped up big in the past and. 
People in New York know that, certainly, uh, when he took the bow against the Knicks a couple of years ago. So he's a big-time player, big-game player. DeJounte is uh, is terrific. And, uh, you, you know, I think that I think they've got a fighting chance in this series. Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting note where you talk about, you know, maybe being able to steal game one. All of a sudden you can flip, you know, that home court advantage that is such a, a benefit of being the higher seed. And you have the team that's coming in, you know, kind of hot off of a, a, a really big play-in game uh, atmosphere and moment momentum while the other team like you said has been kind of sitting for a while that could be interesting if they can sneak that right off the bat and um yeah. i i know you know well, that's obviously, the way, you know that's that's the whole thing with the with the playoffs you want to try to get one of two games yeah uh, the first two and then you can swing the the home court advantage and a couple of years ago in the eastern finals when the hawks played against milwaukee they actually won game one up there in milwaukee so it really it changed the whole series a little bit and uh, I think if the Hawks can pull off one of these two, I, I, I have I sort of feel like the first one might be the the one that you could do it on easier than the second one because there's going to be three days in between games. Uh, they play on Saturday and then not until Tuesday again. Mm. So uh, I think if the Hawks go in there and can get that afternoon game and and see what they can do and maybe steal one and then come home to Atlanta, it, it's funny you know the 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 Hawks and Celtics the. The last couple of times they played in the playoffs, uh, 2008 was one year. It went seven games. That was the famous uh, Zaza Pachulia uh, game against uh. the uh, against the Celtics and Kevin Garnett and the uh, the whole Rocky thing. And then uh, you know, uh, uh, several years ago they played another seven game series, and uh, it's just been kind of wild the way the two teams have played. And you go all the way back to you know 88 that famous uh, Larry Bird Dominique series too. That was a seven game series that came right down to the end. And they still talk about that game seven and it's still showed, I think on uh, ESPN classic a lot. And uh, it's just funny how it's, it's broken out that way that the, the Hawks and Celtics have met in so many of these big playoff series. Well, and I think it adds to that. And now you bring in, you know, you mentioned the bow and how, you know, Trey is kind of taken on, relishing that you know uh playoff villain role when he's right. on the road um yeah, having, yeah. having a player like him that isn't going to you know cower from that that spotlight on the road and the in the a crowd that you you know you sit there in person and know how harsh those boston crowds can be i, I think that's really interesting to see if if he can you know, get a little, get a little of that fire going early uh, and, and play into it with the crowd. It could really lead to something in that opening game. Yeah. I mean, the one thing about him, he's not shy. Uh, <laughs> you know, he'll, he'll come down the floor and shoot. And, and, and like I said earlier, Quinn Snyder has pretty much given the green light uh, even more so uh, on these three point shots. Uh, if you've got a good shot, take it. He's told all of them that Bogey Bogdanovich, who's, uh, you know, excellent three point shooter comes off the bench and, uh, you know, he'll lead that group off the bench. So uh, I think you can expect to see kind of uh, the, the Hawks fire away. And that was that was their attitude the other night in, in Miami, too. Uh, you know, just if you've got the shot, take it. Don't be afraid to take it. Uh, and they, they always say this is a miss or make league. Right. So, you know, if you if you make take enough of them, you make them, you can win a game. And that's I think that's the thought right now. I like it. I think it's a lot of fun. And obviously, you know, it's understandable why some people are favoring the Celtics. They've had a very strong season. They have an incredibly deep roster. Well, they, but... they deserve to be fair. They're the number two seed for a reason. So, uh, you know, I could see where people, uh, you know, I heard some of the Boston talk shows earlier in the week talking about uh, if it goes six games, it's a it's a it's a defeat. You know, they, they, they're just kind of looking at the. Uh, the Hawks are being looked at in Boston as kind of the Washington generals right now. So uh, I think that's, that's an advantage for them too, in my mind uh, that they, you know, it's the us against the world type thing. And uh, they've been pretty good at that the last few years. Absolutely. And I think, you know, some of the more famous, uh, you know, Celtics supporters and media people uh, like Bill Simmons, I think was openly rooting for Atlanta to beat Miami in that game, that it was a gift for them if Atlanta could beat them. So I, I'm sure that's some bulletin board material that will make its way to the locker room. Oh, I, well, I mean, I'm sure they're going to uh, they know exactly what's been happening, you know, so uh, it's going to be interesting. It'll be you know, like you say, the crowd there is going to be crazy. Uh, you know, it might be at a little advantage for the Hawks that it's an afternoon game too. It's, uh, you know, not the night game where, 
they can spend all day Saturday getting tanked up in Boston, you know. So. <laughs> that that coin is lubricated in the in the crowd. So yeah. before before we get you out of here, Steve, I know you, you've obviously you see all these teams up close and in person, um, specifically all the teams in the East with how strong that Eastern Conference has been in the in the movement. You know, Durant leaves and and you see Brooklyn still try to hold their own, but that that top group has really separated themselves to this point with Boston, Milwaukee, Philadelphia, and you know moments for the the Cavaliers. Where is your mind at as far as who you think is is really positioning themselves? to make it out of this Eastern Conference this year? Well, I I like Milwaukee uh, still. I mean, Giannis is Giannis, and uh, they've been together a while, and there's a reason they're the number one seed too. Yeah. So uh, I, I would make them the favorites. Uh, Philadelphia, I don't know. They've had problems, you know, in the past in the second round or, or whatever. Cleveland, don't sleep on Cleveland either, though. Uh, they're a very good defensive team, uh, and they've, you know, they've got Donovan Mitchell too. So that, you know, uh, you can you have him on the floor anytime you've got a good chance. And, uh, you know, I think that series against the Knicks is going to be terrific too. Uh, it, it's really kind of everything's, I think the whole league right now, I, I mean, even though there's, you know, a couple at the top on both East and West, but it's, it's kind of wide open, you know, somebody could slip through the cracks there and, and then you've got a wide open field for the championship. Yeah, it, it, the West is is not as top heavy, but there's so many different interesting ones. I, I'm happy for Sacramento fans to finally get in. Not not quite as fun to get your first playoff spot and you make it to the three seed and you you get the defending champion Golden State Warriors. Is that well, not know, quite ideal cool experience? But you know, Kevin Herter, uh, yeah, you know Clifton Park, who uh, you know played here with the Hawks and he almost single handedly won a game seven against Philadelphia in Philadelphia. Uh, and that was in a semifinal series. So he certainly has some playoff experience, you know, and uh, I wouldn't count them out either. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, we, we certainly appreciate your time today. This has been a ton of fun, uh, you know, being able to, to talk with you about everything going on here. And uh, I know tomorrow night you'll be there uh, as the voice of the Atlanta Hawks uh, as they face off against the Boston Celtics. Uh, as you see uh, Steve's uh, description there, you can follow him at Real Voice of Hawk. Uh, make sure you're checking him out. Uh, Steve, anything else for the fans before we sign off? I, I think we're good. I, you know, let's get it started. I appreciate your time very, very much. And now back to the show. Really cool conversation. It was a ton of fun to be able to talk to someone like Steve who gets to, you know, really take in every single game in person and understand the ebbs and flows of what these teams go through. So uh, always cool to be able to talk to somebody like him who has such a uh, interesting and rich perspective. Uh, before we go to our next conversation, um, I know producer Chris was upset that I snuck in uh, a victory on the last Greg doesn't know segment. So uh, I, I expect to be, you know, harshly uh, 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 challenged here in, in this week's uh, episode. We'll see what what way he has in store for me. Uh, I really like the the logo here, scratching out the the show logo for for Greg doesn't know this is nice work. All right, let's see what we get. Our first quarter of questions. So I, I'm going to take that as maybe there's four questions. We'll see. Uh, first, what current player? has three of the top four single game performances for three points made. Oh man. Um, so most of the crazy statistics for three pointers are, are all Steph Curry, but there's a couple hot games for both Damian Lillard and clay Thompson. Let's see what he does for him. He's tied for third with Donovan Mitchell and a host of others at nine. Mitchell has done that twice. Okay. Um, so what current player has three of the top four single game performances for three pointers made? So Lillard has a 70 point game along with, along with, uh, Mitchell. I Thompson hasn't quite gotten like crazy white hot this year. It probably should be Curry, but I, I'm going to say Damian Lillard. Woo! All right. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. Got to be able to get a couple right here because the reward is. That's right, Pete. All right. Let's see. Let's see if I can get another one here. 
All right. Our next question. <laughs> How did this feel? A, bad. B, gut punch. C, knee to the ding ding. D, when the wife dies in the first 10 of up. Oh, God. The opening scene of up is the most devastating opening to a cartoon in history. Like, it's so cruel that they go through that amazing journey and, like, how he became the curmudgeonly old man. Oh, my God. This is so, so cruel. Oh, all right. Aaron made me do it. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate it. Uh, that's right. All of the above. All of the above. That, that is the correct answer. That is the correct answer. But all right. I'm proud of myself. All right. I got my second one here. Redeeming myself a little bit after a couple of really ugly opening opening round uh segments of it and without further ado we will go to our friends uh pat moran and rich haynes talking Cavs, nicks and their thoughts on the rest of the playoff series all right and now we welcome on friend of the show rich haynes and for our first appearance someone that you've seen on our uh, cover one uh channels before and i know aaron quinn is a, a frequent uh guest on on his show talking buffalo pat moran pat how we doing Doing good, man. Uh, we're here for a Buffalo Bills watch draft, right? <laughs> that is the the most common yeah. topic going on. But you know, this time of year, it's fun. You know, we try to uh, on the Greg Thompson Sports Show talk about you know what's going on. So as we had opening day for baseball, and as we've gotten into March Madness, and you know now. I know not everyone is, you know, an enormous basketball fan NBA wise, but I think most everyone appreciates and enjoys playoff basketball where, you know, who many people think are the best athletes on earth are going at their hardest every single, uh, every single play. And you get that really, you know, tight competitive tension through it so i i love nba playoffs it's one of my favorite things to watch uh in the this stretch where we're about to start you know the we have the playing games tonight some of them going on while we're talking right now uh and other ones starting tomorrow uh with the kickoff for uh the first four series we pretty much have playoff basketball every single night for two months now so um you know rich we'll have you kind of lead us off here before we get into the fun topic of the of the the conversation with Cavs knicks Looking at some of the differences in the two conferences, the West is pretty wide open. You could convince me anyone, you know, from the first seed to the seventh seed could make a run here. Who do you think you should be the favorite or, or what are, who are you most concerned with making it through the West? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question, and you're right. I mean, parity for once is kind of king uh, in in the NBA, which is kind of nice right now. I mean, certainly you still have some great teams in both conferences, but you know the the you know I think the era of the super team that right now is kind of on a, a pause, which is you know which is really nice. And to be honest, you know I I don't I don't have any clue who the heck's going to come out of the West. I mean, you know everyone's going to probably point to the Suns a little bit with with KD going over there, but I don't know. I, I, I you know KD. Yeah, I like KD, but I don't know how he's really going to fit in. They haven't. I'm saying they're eight no together. with him, but it's eight games. <laughs> it's eight games. So I would say, I mean, you know, I'd probably lean a little bit towards the Suns. You know, the Nuggets, I, I think, are a flawed one seed in in my opinion. So I, I don't really see them coming out. You know, uh, Memphis, I don't see them coming out as well. I'm really interested in the Kings Warriors series. I'm sure we'll get into that, mm. but you know, I think I think the Suns are probably your odds on favor. But again, to your point, I don't know because I don't know, you know, that we've seen enough of of KD and Booker and Chris Paul together and in Aiton, right? So I, it's it's going to be fun for sure out yeah. west. Pat, do you feel differently, or which series are you most looking forward to here in the West? I'm 100 percent with Rich. Actually, yeah. um, I really don't know. I I like the fact that the Western Conference isn't about one team or maybe yeah. two teams like it's been in years past it truly i don't know if i want to use the word parody but there's a good four or five teams that could come out and you know in phoenix is the popular pick right now the trendy pick and i completely understand why you can definitely can't sleep on golden yeah. state and what they've accomplished a lot of these teams near the top just people aren't talking about them much memphis and sacramento you know these are two really good teams yeah. with deep rosters and a, and a lot of talent I love the fact that I don't know what's going to happen at all. I, I tend to lean towards Phoenix, but 
you know, they, they can lose in the first round too. Just as it's just crazy how the West is this year and how the kind of balance of talent has shifted a little bit in the last couple of years. I don't know. I'm excited though. Yeah, I, I think that you brought up a really interesting one in that you have two teams that had phenomenal regular seasons. Yeah. Memphis played fantastic. Sacramento ran everybody off the court, and their reward is you get to be underdogs in the first yeah. round of the playoffs to the defending champ Golden State Warriors and the finally healthy for a moment Los Angeles Lakers. And that, you know, I, I still – kind of think memphis and sacramento can win but i get it why it's basically a coin flip or heck i think vegas has golden state as a pretty oh, healthy yeah. favorite over yeah. sacramento yeah healthy yeah. yeah yeah i think it's minus 275 for the series right now which you know certainly there's other series that are much stronger than that you know you have you know minus 1000 odds in the 76ers brooklyn nets yeah. uh, series for example but yeah still minus 275 for the six seed versus the three seed and you know, really, and, and you know, just, just to jump to that series for a moment, it's it's because the Kings can't defend anybody, right? I mean, they, they give up a fifth, sixth most points in the league. So, you know, from a betting perspective, I loved betting player prop parlays in Kings games all year because yeah. everyone's hitting their player props. And, you know, those games usually were flying over the over-unders. So, you know, while I love Sabonis and, you know, I like what Keegan Murray's done as a young player, I, you know, love De'Aaron Fox, but I just – I don't know how the heck they stop Clay and and Curry. I mean, if those guys get rolling, I, I, you know, I just uh, I think I think the Warriors probably do come out of that series. You know, again, not to maybe jump ahead there, but um, but that is a very intriguing series. I mean, it's probably the one I'm most interested in because I love the Kings as a team. I love that Sacramento's back in the playoffs and the Beam and all that crap. But um, you know, that's that's the one I'm most interested in out west uh, to you know kick things off in round one. So let's shift a little bit back to the East and, and we'll, we'll hold our special series off to the side. It, I know it's, it's kind of become a top three in the East and that most people see it as, you know, can the depth of Boston beat you know, how ridiculous Giannis is. I think that maybe some of Milwaukee's depth gets underrated with, with who else they have there. And then, I think everyone sees how powerful Embiid is and knows what Harden can do, but it's, you know, it's kind of hard to get those previous playoff flops from Harden out of your mind. I, I, I am afraid of playing as a Cavs fan. I'm more afraid of playing Philly because I see how impossible it is to stop Embiid. And I've seen, I think that the, the style of play you can go at, um, you know, Milwaukee and Boston and just, you know, win tough games. But I also don't know if Philly's going to make it that far. So we'll start with you, Pat. Who do you think is the team to beat coming out of the East? Well, I think Milwaukee's definitely the team to beat. And to your point about Philadelphia, as a Knicks fan, I really wanted to finish fifth. And we're going to talk about the Cleveland New York series, I'm sure, in just a minute here. And that's no disrespect to Cleveland. I think they're a loaded team and they're a lot of fun to watch. It's just because of one player. Indeed, I just felt like it would be a horrible matchup for the Knicks. So it was important for me as a Knicks fan for them to not finish in the sixth seed and have to play Philly in the first round. But to your point, Philly, there, there's no guarantee Philly's getting out of the first round. They are, to me, of all the teams in both conferences right now, they might be the biggest, maybe except for the Lakers, they might be the biggest enigma right now. It's like, I really don't know what to expect. They have arguably the best player going right now. But a guy in Harden, like you said, with some of his past playoff performances, I'm a Philly fan. I'm sleeping uneasy right now. Yeah, um, I've got a I've got a 15 to one uh, ticket on the on the Sixers to win the title uh, that okay. I don't mind having. That like I, I feel okay about that one, but I also won't be shocked if I have to tear it up in like by my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> So, Rich, who who do you like at the top? Obviously, we see a lot more of the East games, you know, watching all the all the Cavs games and things like that. But who do you think is that team to beat in in the East right now? Yeah, you know, and, and for those out there, you know, Greg's birthday is in like two weeks, so yeah, that, that ticket might be getting torn <laughs> up uh, pretty pretty quickly based on that comment. But you know, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, the, the Bucks. I think the Bucks are Celtics. Um, you know, the Sixers. Uh, uh, you know, as good as Embiid is. 
you know, the, the, the lack of playoff success at this point, um, I, I, I don't love, and I don't necessarily love their matchup with the Celtics in the next round, uh, assuming they both move through. I mean, I think the Celtics are going to handle the Hawks pretty, pretty easily. And, you know, I like the Nets, um, but they don't really have an identity. In, in my opinion, there's a lot of just, you know, wing players, although it was it, real quick, kind of nice. good on them for not, going completely in the tank after that Durant and, sure. and Kyrie trade and, yeah. you know, Mikael Bridges, you know, playing Bridges the way Durant. he has. And, but I think I, I heard this, I think on Ryan Rosillo, um, everybody feels like basically the way I just phrased that, but you have to remember they've also gone 13 and 17 since that trade. Right. Uh, like KD's record had them up there enough that, yeah, they've treaded water since then, but people feel maybe feel mm-hmm. a little inflated that like, Hey, Good for them for not completely going in the bag, but they've also been a sub five hundred team since then. And I, I so I do feel like the Sixers will get out of the first round, but I don't know yeah. about past there. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they will have an answer for Embiid at all. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the first round, and you know, regard again, Spencer Dinwiddie's done a really nice job for them at point guard, which has been interesting. I mean, his assist numbers were through the roof since you know he he moved over there uh, to Brooklyn. You know, Bridges has done a nice job, but again, they're, they're a lot of similar wing type players. Um, you know, Claxton's, a, a, you know, decent defensively, but he's not going to be able to, to handle and beat. So I think that's an easy advantage. So I would say I, I, I have the Celtics as the best team um, coming out of the East. I mean, I, you know, I, I can't disagree with, uh, you know, with Pat's comments on, on the box, I mean, especially some of their depth with Bobby Portis. I think he's super, super underrated. He's a heck of a, a player, you know, holidays, a great point guard. Um, but I just think if the Celtics are playing at their top, you know, kind of their top with, with Tatum and, and Jalen, you know, Jalen Brown this year, I just have, a, you know, and smart is a great complimentary player. Horford is still somehow hanging around as a great complimentary player, which is crazy to me because I can remember the Cavs and LeBron kicking crap out of the Hawks, whatever, a decade ago, you know, yes, Horford was there and he's still, you know, hanging around and, 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 you know, being productive. So I think if the Celtics are playing at their peak, you know, Giannis, I, I think is the best player. I think the Celtics as a team are playing at their peak. You know, I have the Celtics as, a, as the team to be in the East. So now to the reason that I had you two fine gentlemen on here, uh, Pat, we'll just start with a general question. How nice is it to care about playoff basketball as a Knicks fan? You know, I don't talk much about the Knicks on Twitter because they've been bad for the most part for so long. And I already have had to deal with that with the Sabres on the hockey side for so long. And then obviously 17 years with the Bills. I'm just, this is the first year. Now the Knicks made the playoffs a couple years ago, but I kind of felt like that was, I felt like they didn't have a chance. They were just one of those happy to be there kind of uh, seasons for the Knicks. This, this team to me feels different. And, I, and I'm excited about them. 47 wins is the, the most they've had in a decade. Their second most in like 21, 22 years, something like that. This is a a young team, a good team, a, a team with a lot of depth. They're, they're good at the top of the roster. They're, they're probably nine or 10 deep. And I'm looking forward, you know, we're, we're dropping this here now on Friday night. I can't wait to wake up on Saturday. In fact, I already put something out on Twitter and I'm uh, – in Buffalo searching for fellow Nick fans. And I want to go to a bar somewhere on Saturday at 6 PM. I don't want to watch game one somewhere. It's been a long time since uh, I've been this much into the NBA and specifically the Knicks. I am truly, really excited about this series. I really am. Well, and obviously the whole dynamic that this brings into play of one Jalen Brunson being ridiculously exceeding expectations, sure. you know, having Emmanuel quickly, you know, emerge the way that he has. And then you have the dynamic of everyone assuming Donovan Mitchell was going to New York yep. and then he ends up in Cleveland. And it obviously, I think that hindsight's easy, but, you know, I, I think getting Mitchell would have been awesome for the Knicks, but having it not be this franchise death knell that people thought, like, hey, it actually has kind of worked out okay. Like they've actually been pretty good. And they, of course, adding an it, all NBA talent like Mitchell is always, you know, a, a fantastic piece. But the fact that it turned out this way, I, for one, I, I'm excited about game one and game two in Cleveland, but I can't wait to see Mitchell in MSG for game three yeah. for the, hey, don't forget what you missed out on performance. Like I can't, I, I can't wait to see him have that opportunity and see where it goes. Um, Rich, what are your thoughts on this matchup that honestly 
was, I think, a pretty tight one back and forth this season that, you know, some matchups without Randall, some without Jared Allen. It's tough to get a full read off the regular season matchup, but both teams threw some haymakers uh, in the regular season this year. Yeah, so I personally feel, uh, I'm curious what Pat's comments are going to be on this, but I think the, the regular season games you can completely throw out. I don't think any of them matter because, you know, if you look at all of those games, the Knicks have not played the Cavs with their main starting lineup or current rotational depth for any of the games. Even the game, even the first game the Cavs won, Darius Garland didn't play. Now the Cavs won that game. Um, there was a great game, game, I think it was game two or three. It was 105, 103, I believe, uh, you know, New York won. Um, but, you know, the Cavs still had love in the rotation. He was like a minus 20 in that game. Um, they started Diakite, one of the games against the Knicks, Lamar Stevens. Uh, the game that Brunson went off for 48, there was no Okoro, no Allen, um, Porcino Randall for the Knicks as well. So, yeah, I mean, if Brunson's going to go off for 48, you know, yeah, the Knicks have certainly are, are going to be in, in, in good shape. Um, so I just – but I don't think you can take much from the regular season because, honestly, the, the Cavs in none of those games had the team you're going to see game one in the playoffs with that defensive versatility between Okoro, assuming he plays, which he's trending like he's going to play game one. Uh, with his knees, but not the last uh, six, seven games with a, a knee injury. But the defensive versatility you're going to have with Okoro and Mobley, you know, that's really the reason why the Cavs, from a you know Pythagorean wins perspective, is 55. You know, they're four wins over their actual season wins at 51. They're number one defensive rated team in the league, and that's why, because of that versatility on the perimeter between Mobley and Okoro. And I think that is going to provide, you know, some fits for the Knicks players that haven't seen that in the four regular season games, you know, versus the Cavs to this point. Um, curious, you know, I know Randall right now, it's a mystery, right? He's, he's, yeah, I was going to ask Pat about that next. Yeah. But are they just playing coy? You know, are they playing coy with Randall and kind of just, you know, seeing what's going to happen? There? So I'm curious. He, he's practiced twice this week, in, at least in a limited capacity. Still don't know if he's going to be able to go on Saturday. And if he does, to, to what effect he'll, uh, you know, how effective he, he will be. Obviously, he's a, you know, he's a key player having 25 points, like 10 rebounds a game. Um, and I think there's also – it's interesting with the three-day rest between game one and game two. Yeah. I think there's a lot of temptation of, hey, if we sit him for game one and you get him, you know, you all the way till Tuesday and you get full Sunday, Monday, and during the day Tuesday to keep going on the rehab, you know, would we get the version of Randall that we want for game two? I'm really curious how that how that plays out. Obi Tope has played well, and, and, and you know he's had five starts now in his absence. And he's no Julius Randle, so I'm not trying to say that he is. It's just, you know, Greg, this is one of those situations where, kind of liking it with with the Bills in Minnesota, where like a trade happened and both teams won. You know, the Bills got Diggs, Minnesota got a first round pick, which turned into Jefferson. In this case, it's like I think both teams were better off for Donovan Mitchell not ending up going to the Knicks. He's a cornerstone player. He's a great player. But if he goes to the Knicks, I don't know that Brunson is what he was this year. And you're talking giving up, you know, R.J. Barrett and, and, and top and maybe quickly and like at least three or four first round picks as well. So I, I think this is one of those deals that it actually worked out well for both these teams. And to play each other in the first round, it's just uh, yeah. it's gravy, man. I really <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. I, I, re, I really, truly am. Yeah, what, I, what's, I think. Well, what's perfect. interesting to me real quick is just, you know, down the stretch, you had Toppin, you had Grimes, you had Quickly, you know, really have some, some nice report performances. Again, you know, down the stretch in the NBA is weird because, you know, all these teams are playing sure. games against other teams that, you know, aren't necessarily giving it their best effort. But, you know, the pace for the Knicks quickened without Julius Randle and some of those players really, you know, I think had some more impactful performances with the, you know, the, the added usage on the offensive end of the court. So I'm curious to see if Randle does play, and he kind of alluded to it, you know, to what degree, but – also, you know, what does that in, what does that affect the Knicks offense that they're kind of used to running here over the last few weeks without Randall with maybe a little bit faster pace of play? Um, because, you know, again, Randall, you know, when he's on from outside, certainly creates a, a dynamic that's difficult. But from a Cavs defensive perspective, I, you know, I think the Cavs almost much rather have Randall, you know, who's a little bit slower player sitting out there at the three-point arc then having to defend, you know, some maybe, uh, you know, more versatile players and, and quickly and grinds getting a little bit more usage. Sure. Um, I think to your point, Toppin, you know, I, I don't know you can, can you know, think the Toppin's going to be scoring 30 points a game or anything like that. He had a couple of nice performances down the stretch. But, um, and Dayton, Dayton shout out, OH, 
Ohio boy, Dayton shout out for, for Obi. Um, but I'm curious. I'm just interested to see when Randall comes back. Does that, you know, is there an adjustment period for the Knicks now on the offensive end of the court? So the last question I want to ask, I, I won't ask you two who you think is going to win the series because I'm pretty sure I know the answer for, for that for both of you. Um, so I'll ask each of you the same question. If the Cavs or if the Knicks win, what odds do you give them versus obviously I think it doesn't really matter for the play-in game tonight of whether it's Chicago or, or, or who right. goes against Milwaukee. What chance do you give your team against Milwaukee in the second round? We'll start with you, Pat. Not good. <laughs> just gonna keep it gonna keep it real here not good um I, I i guess you never know uh again a couple years ago i was just happy to be in the playoffs yeah. this year i expect to win this series not taking it for granted cleveland's a great team but i have expectations that the knicks could win this series um i don't have much realistic expectations that they could beat Milwaukee as much as I would love to say, I could see the Knicks getting lucky or getting hot and going on this long playoff run. I just, if I'm being honest with you, I, I think the, the, the series, they can get past Cleveland. I don't see them getting past Milwaukee. Just don't. How about you, Rich? Yeah. You know, and you know, obviously to your point, I think that the Cavs will, will win this series. Although I, I do think it's going to be, you know, a fun series, you know, a closely contested series. I, I think Cavs in six, is probably what, you know, I would go if I would make a, a prediction here. Um, you know, once they get out of that round, you know, I, I'm not going to say they're going to beat the Bucks because I don't I think, you know, that would be uh, probably not very, uh, very intelligent. But I do, I'd much rather play the Bucks than the 76ers. And, uh, you know, for example, yeah, and weirdly, for whatever yeah. reason, we, and B kills us. And B makes Jared Allen a, a, a not, great defender, uh, uh, almost a non-factor in games, which I, in my opinion, he's the only player in the NBA that makes Jared Allen not a factor for whatever reason. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's mental. I mean, obviously it beats a huge, you know, a huge human, right? But it, Allen has the, the, very he, he can use his 290 pounds in a way that nobody else can against Allen. Yeah. And so, you know, Greek freak, don't get me wrong, a hell of a player. But I think the Cavs, again, with Mobley's versatility and Okoro's versatility, even though Okoro's not, you know, doesn't have the height, I think they have the ability to slow down you know, Giannis a little bit and put it on a holiday to have a big series, put it on Bobby Portis to have, you know, and he's very capable. Like I said, I mentioned earlier, I really like Bobby Portis as a, as a complimentary player, but put it on somebody like Bobby Portis. Um, you know, we've lost a game against Milwaukee solely because uh, Brooke Lopez, you know, hit six threes or something crazy. Right. But I much rather, but we forced that to happen. So I think in a seven game series, I think the Cavs have a fighting chance if they continue to do that defensively and force Brooke Lopez to beat them. Right. I don't think, you know, Philly, for example, I just think MB just kills us. So I would much rather play the Bucs. Uh, the Celtics and the Cavs had some really nice fights this yep. year, you know, just to kind of compare the top three. So I think the Celtics would get past us as well, as I mentioned there. You know, they're my favorite. But I think that would be an interesting series. So I think the Cavs would lose. But I think they would, I think they would get a couple games against the yep. Bucs, you know, maybe losing six, something like that. I think both teams are in a really similar spot where coming in, you know, I, I think Vegas obviously has Cleveland as a favorite and I think fully healthy, they probably are supposed to win, but the Knicks are good enough that they absolutely can win this series. And I think both teams are in a spot where you have a young core all building together. Everything you achieve going forward is kind of gravy where if you get a first round playoff win, uh, series win and then win one or two games in the second round that's inarguably a successful season like if you win a series and win the next round you had a good year and now know that you're bringing back pretty much that entire core for the next season and um you know short of you know i think that to your point earlier pat the the way that this has now played out i don't know that the current iteration of the knicks is a championship core but the fact that so many of those trade assets played so well that now you know what you have in those other players yeah. and now could still make a move for whoever the next donovan mitchell guy is and if the knicks all of a sudden package pieces together and added jimmy butler or package pieces together and added i don't think it'll be dame lillard but whoever whoever the next donovan mitchell player that comes available is now 
maybe quickly as more of a centerpiece of a trade. Maybe now, whereas he was not a throw in, but wasn't necessarily a, a centerpiece of a, of a thing. I think that there is a chance that the Knicks have structured themselves in a way that they can come out of not getting Donovan Mitchell as not this huge missed opportunity and that they could still do it. I think they need to, I think they need to make a move to find that one more piece. But the fact that they're in that spot, I think speaks to the, uh, the, the structure of it. So um, appreciate you guys time tonight. This was a lot of fun. Uh, really looking forward to this series. I'm sure we'll have some fun on Twitter and, and looking forward to, to watching these games. And I will let you guys know, we're actually playing around with using the playback app to be able to go in and do some watch parties uh, to be able to go on and, and have some of our voices there to, to watch the games and react. That could be a fun way to uh, take in some of these games as well. So we'll let you guys know about that. Um, but without further ado, thank you very much to Rich Haynes. Make sure you're following him, Burn River Sports and Rich is 13 on Pickett. Make sure you're checking out Pat. You can find Pat Moran tweets on uh, Twitter or his show, Talking Buffalo. Uh, but without further ado, we'll head back to the show. Oh, it's fun to have the guys on and <clears throat> be able to talk through and I am happy for Knicks fans. I think it's exciting. I think that obviously the Cavs are ecstatic that they got Donovan Mitchell. It was a perfect, perfect timing of where you know Jared Allen was already already under contract. Darius Garland had already signed his extension. Evan Mobley was coming up the way that he was. It was perfect timing to add in a player like that where Mitchell's 26, Jared Allen's 25, you know, uh Mobley and Garland are 21 and 22. It's really smart in the trajectory of where their organization's going. And I think it was, you know, understandable that the Knicks were kind of trying to play hardball, trying to be able to set themselves up that they knew they thought they were still going to be able to get um, the guy they wanted. <clears throat> and the fact that they missed on that, I, I think was seen as this huge whiff by many. And the fact that their season has turned out as well as it has is really um, a positive and something that I'm really happy for Knicks fans. Cause I know there's a lot of, uh, common bills and Knicks fans. So um, our last segment for tonight is going to be the worst. Uh, and by the worst, I mean our poll that, that we've had going up. It's been a ton of fun and kind of looking through each of the different pieces of, of where we go through. And this was a runaway. Uh, we actually even had to retire them. It was too dominant of a win. Um, we had folks who come in five minutes before a restaurant closes looking for food facing off with the adult who fights a foul ball away from a kid at a major league baseball game, a dominant 81 to 19 win. Cause that person really is, you know, someone that, you know, it, it's hard to take seriously and truly takes the title. She is the worst. She's the worst person in the world. Uh, we actually even had some people had some video that they brought in, which is fantastic. Uh, here, uh, co cover one's own, uh, David Fox, you know, foul ball away from kid is heinous, but very heat of the moment, I feel. Plus, you get publicly shamed on television most of the time, which is true. Uh, but the guy winding food just before closing will pitch a fit and try to use technicalities to get their way when they could just go somewhere else. Um, Randy Hardman added in here. There is probably a major overlap in the type of people who would rip a ball away from a kid and who would go into a, a restaurant five minutes before close. Uh, however, due to the volume of occurrence, he went with the five minutes before close guy. Screw that guy. I, I respect it. Um, here, Chris Janke put in a video that was perfect. This was uh, in between innings, outfielders playing catch, and the outfielder turns, looks at a group of kids, throws them the ball and this guy runs over reaches over top of them and catches the ball and turns away he, it's literally the exact thing i'm thinking of like I, I gave kind of a pass in the last game if it's a home run ball and you're watching it off the bat and looking up i might move a fair amount to my left right forward or back to try to catch that ball and I'm not looking down to see who I'm reaching over. I'm trying to get a home run ball. Like I, I give a fair amount of grace to somebody in in-game action trying to catch a ball there. But when it's clearly intended for a kid and it's just a, a ball that they were playing catch with, it, the kid's going to be excited about, but, well, you're going to put a ball on your shelf. This is, oh, uh, I, the outfielder for the Tampa Bay Rays was playing catch with this. Like, you're not mounting that on your shelf like that's silly uh that was ex exactly the kind of guy that, that i was targeting um so here producer lauren has presented our new face-off challenge uh we are going to have uh dan freddy's uh su submission of this is near the top of the list for him 
sm smoking directly at the doorway of a public entrance so others have to smell it <laughs> as uh as you walk through uh that's up there for him that's a that's a good one i know a lot of places you're supposed to be so many feet away from the the exit so when somebody's right at the doorway and you have to walk through smoke and you know it's so weird you know i'm i'm a 42 uh you know growing up in an age where like smoking was really common and like there were smoking sections in restaurants and you could smoke it you know i i wasn't alive for smoking on airplanes uh but or i wasn't traveling at that point in my life uh but a lot of different smoking and now it just cracks me up like how foreign it feels when you see someone smoking be like oh i forgot people do that oh okay all right uh coming up against the opponent here uh, uh rory presley submitted uh, if I send you an email and ask you to respond via email, why are you calling me? I, I'll even add that when you text someone and they call you back. If, if I wanted to call you, I would have just called you. <laughs> uh, so I think that's a pretty good one. This will be our new poll for this week. So we'll get that uh, submitted and, and roll in here. It'll be a fun one to go. But that will be our new one for this week. Um, tonight's show has been a ton of fun. It was great. Thank you to Steve Holman. Uh, thank you to our guests, uh, Rich Haynes and Pat Moran. A uh, huge thank you to producer Chris and Lauren. I appreciate all their help and support. Uh, hope that everybody is able to uh, enjoy time with their family. Last week, we had a pre-recorded show because I was away at Disney with my family. It was a wonderful trip. Uh, I hope that you guys are able to have fun uh, with you and your family. Find some time to be good to each other, and we'll let Daniel Craig take us out of here. Ladies and gentlemen, the weekend. <laughs> Take care. We'll talk soon.